Chapter seven. This is about property transactions and about determining basis, deciding on some simple gain scenarios that or loss scenarios that would be a result of the type of acquisition that it was and the effect of those uh, nuances. And so um, we'll talk about some of those things. Plus, we'll discuss some disallowed losses. We'll, we'll discuss some deferred gains. We'll talk about some non-recognition uh, issues. And so basically, we're starting this first little piece here with some information you already know. The assets, if you're trying to spread the cost of those, you would do, do it not by writing them off the first year most of the time, although in tax, it's hard to tell that since they give us so many opportunities to write them off quickly. But in any case, um, if it's a tangible asset, you would do depreciation to spread the cost rather than writing off as an expense um, just like supplies or expense or uh, utility expense. But in any case, you would record it as an asset and then spread the cost using depreciation for tangible assets that are not natural resources. And then if it is a natural resource, you'll spread the cost in a similar manner, but using depletion, which is sort of like units of production depreciation. But in any case, you, um, you've been exposed to all that. It's not changed. It's still the same sort of thing. Um, depreciation or is also known as cost recovery in tax. And then amortization is the third um, method of spreading a cost of a long-term asset and that is for intangible assets. So those haven't changed. But then once you look at the uh, tangible assets, there's two subtypes really. There's either real estate or not real estate. So if it's realty, that is real estate. So that's talking about the land and the permanently affixed uh, buildings that are on it or anything that's permanently affixed to it actually but so that is becomes part of the land and so in that um, it is it is considered part of the real estate if it's permanently affixed so all right so it's either realty or it's not if it's not realty then the term I like to use is personality there's some um other words that can be used to mean it's not real estate, but it's, those are a little bit more ambiguous in my mind. So some people just call it personal property, real property and personal property. And so I don't like that as well because it kind of has a connotation that it's not business use assets and that's not what they're trying to say. So um, you, you are just trying to split it into two baskets, basically. One is this is the real estate and this is the non-real estate. And so realty and personality is the terms I'm going to be using. All right. So once I know that it is one of those two categories, either realty or personality, then I'm going to still have to decide, is this business use asset? So like, do I use it in my proprietorship or my corporation? Then it's a business use asset. Or um, do I use it in my farm? That's business use. And then income producing property means it's going to produce, it's going to be involved in the production of income. And so it still would be similar to a business use from the standpoint of you could take a deduction, you could take a loss if you have a loss. But then you have the personal use property and you have to keep that one straight because a lot of times you can't deduct depreciation on a personal asset if it's for personal use and you can't deduct losses on personal assets most of the time. And so um, these um, with probably all the time because it would be classified as income producing or business if you were able to take losses on it. Uh, but in any case, um, this is why you have to separate them because the rules are different for business use, for income producing, and for personal use property. So we have to look at each asset, see is it tangible or intangible. Then once we know it's tangible, is it realty or is it not? Then once we know it's those tangible assets or, or the intangible asset, any of the business use assets and income producing assets can be, we can depreciate and that does change its adjusted basis as you do that. And so this is just a reminder because we already covered all this in the previous tax class or in, even in the financial class because a lot of these things are similar. Um, but the also the term placed in service is talking about when an asset was actually put to use for one of these purposes. Okay, and so the next little piece, let's pull up that set piece. Let's see if I can get us down further. If I can get my mouse to respond, that would help. All right, so now talking about dispositions. 
um, in order to find out what our gain or loss would be on any of these transactions that we're going to be dealing with, we have to know first how much was realized on the sale. So basically that's the proceeds from the sale or also known as what did I get for it? If I sold the asset, what did I get for it? And so um, that amount realized includes a few things. The most logical and reasonable one that we always think of is the cash that you get. When you think of cash proceeds, you're talking about how much did I get paid for the asset when I sold it? And that is true. It's part of the deal. But then there's some other things that could affect it. So you, the cash you received is part of the amount you realized. Plus, if you got other property besides cash, the fair market value of that other property would have to be included in the amount that you received to, as part of your amount realized. And then the third one that we don't think about a lot of times is if you were released from some debt that you owed on the property that you just sold, then that is an additional amount that was paid to you. Because if you didn't get released, you'd have to pay off the debt with the proceeds you got for the sale. So anytime the buyer assumes your debt, that is an additional item that you received in the transfer. So it's an amount realized for the sale. Anything you were released from, uh, any debt that you were released from. So those three things add together to become the main part of the amount realized. It's the amount of the cash you got, the other assets, the fair market value that you, of those other assets you got, plus any debt you were released from when you transferred the asset. Okay, and then you take that number as a kind of a subtotal for amount realized, reduce it by the selling expenses like commissions and, you know, appraisals, different things you had to pay because you were making the sale. And then reduce also, this is another one, a little bit tricky and a little less likely, but possible. You would also reduce your amount realized by any debt that you assumed that belonged to the seller. So sometimes there's a trump in the transaction, there's a deal where the buyer assumes some of the seller's debt in as part of the deal. And if that happens, that's just reducing the amount of the amount you're, that the, you as the seller are realizing. So that's all that together brings you to the amount realized. Then you have to know what is your adjusted basis, because ultimately your, your gain or loss is going to be the amount realized that we just mentioned, plus, um, minus the um, adjusted basis in the, in the uh, asset. And so that's going to give you an amount that's realized uh, gain or realized loss. And so the adjusted basis is nothing but net book value equivalent on a tax basis. So, you know, in financial, we've talked about that lots of times. It's the initial basis plus any improvements minus any depreciation that's been taken. That is the net book value. And so that's what happens here in tax as well. It's just that the calculations of depreciation are sometimes slightly different. Initial basis could be slightly different. Um, and so for tax, we look at the tax basis we have in the asset, which is our tax basis initial basis plus any improvements we've made minus any tax depreciation that's our accumulated depreciation for tax purposes even if it didn't get taken but it should have been that's that allowed or allowable thing so whatever tax whatever depreciation was allowable will reduce the basis in the asset and so those all that netted out brings you to a tax basis net book value also known as the adjusted basis of the asset so the realized gain is just the amount realized that we just discussed minus the adjusted basis that we just discussed. So that gives you the amount that's realized. I mean, this is how much you really made, the net that you profited on the transaction. And then looking at that, you're trying to decide, okay, well, do I have to pay tax on all this or not? And so the amount realized is the taxable piece of it. So the rules, the nuances of this are related to the rules as how much is your basis, how do you treat that basis, and rules about how much of gain has to be recognized or how much a loss is allowed to be deducted. And so all of these together are some of the things we have to learn in order to be able to get this right. So it seems so straightforward. Just take this proceeds minus the basis. That gives you the gain or loss. Yeah, that's true. It's just not quite as straightforward as that. Okay, so now let's go take some of these little issues that come up. 
the rules for different types of assets that you would acquire. So the basis rules for single asset are pretty straightforward. It's the fair market value on the date of the, of the purchase, uh, plus the cost to obtain the property, like if you're paying a lawyer or if, you're, if you had to pay commissions on the purchase, that would be added in. And then you would add to that cost it took to get the asset ready to put into service. So assuming you bought something like a building and it was just great, the location was wonderful, the building was good, you paid for the building, you paid your lawyer to help you transfer the title search, you paid for commissions on this on the purchase and all that's fine. You added all that together, that's your cost. Except if the property's not ready to occupy for the purpose you intended for, for your business, then you might have to customize some things. Like you might have to subdivide the building into little offices or some kind of a, a readjust something in the building if it's being used for manufacturing, set up some new things for manufacturing. So all these costs that you have to add in order to make it be able to be put in service are added to, the, to that cost to get the basis, the initial basis for the asset as it's put in service. So that's a single asset. So then if you had to further complicate it, you might buy a group of assets together or like two assets that are a group or but a lot of assets that are a group, but not actually an ongoing business, just multiple assets. So in that case, you would determine the cost as if it were a single purchase, just like I talked about on the single asset. So you'd add all your, your cost of obtaining, plus you'd add all your setup. Then you would look at it and say, now what is the value of each of these individual items that I purchased together? And so sometimes those prep costs have to be segregated because they only apply to one of the pieces of the one of the assets in the multiple group. But in any case, what you do add all the purchase cost to like the sale expense, but this is the purchase expense. So you you take your initial cost and add those um, the legal fees, commissions, anything that you pay to transfer the asset over. And then if something you're paying to get the property up to shape applies to all of the assets that you bought, you could add that total into. If not, you wait and add those getting it ready for service costs to the individual asset it applies to. But in any case, once you get to this joint cost that is this equivalent that it applies to all of the multiple assets that were bought, then you take that full joint cost and you apply it to each of the assets purchased based on their relative fair market value. So you might have one that's worth 100,000, another one that's worth 50,000, and another one that's worth um, 30,000, another one that's worth 20,000. So you're at 200,000 that you paid um, for this group of assets. And the one assets that was worth 100,000, I'm sorry, I got it wrong, 200,000 that they're all worth, their fair market values. So that $100,000 asset is half of the fair market value. So whatever you actually wrote the check for, plus all the, sell, the buying costs, those, that total, you would take 50% of it for the one asset that had been worth 100 relative to the total fair market value of 200. So you just would prorate it basically. Find a percentage based on their relative fair market values for each asset and multiply it by the total cost of the asset you just invested in. And that's just how you do a multiple asset for a single price. Then similar to that, you would do, if you bought an asset group that was an ongoing business, then what you would do is that same exact methodology. But when you finished, if your total value that you pay, the total price that you had to pay is higher than the, the total fair market value of the asset group, that means you actually paid something for the ongoing business, which is the goodwill portion. So anything that exceeds the collective fair market value of all those assets is considered goodwill. So it would be listed as on your list of assets as one of the um, acquired assets. So that's this entire group of assets, determine the cost as if it were a single asset, allocate by the fair market value, and if the purchase price exceeds, then the excess is goodwill. All right, stock dividends. Most stock dividends are not taxable, but like if it's a pro rata stock dividend, 10% across the board, or if it's a stock split, 
two for one shares, then those are generally non-taxable stock dividends. In those cases, you would just take the value of the stock that the basis that you had in the stock and divide it now by the number of new shares, the total number of shares under the new deal after the stock dividend or stock split. And that then you'd have a new basis per share, but it would still be the total basis for that investment. It just would be a, divided by a different number of shares. If it's a taxable, on the other hand, stock dividend, in other words, it's not prorated is generally what triggers that. Then the, um, basis in the new assets would be the fair market value on the date that those shares were distributed. Um, and then the next one is the gift tax, gift basis. So this one is the stickiest of the basis calcs. And that's because it depends what's going to happen to the asset. Part of it, part of the uh, basis determination is evaluated on the day of the transfer of the gift between the donor, the giver, and the donee, which is the recipient. And so that part of it is determined there. But then, so let me just give it specific. If the fair market value on that day of the gift is higher than the donor's basis, then you would get a carryover basis for the recipient or donee uh, of exactly the same amount as in the hands of the donor. And so if the fair market value has increased or you have what's called appreciated property, then the recipient takes the same basis as the, as the giver or the donor. And so that is a sweet. That's what happens most of the time, actually. But sometimes the asset value is lower than the current asset value at the time of the transfer is lower than the donor paid for it. So it means you have to use what's called a dual basis. And so the dual basis depends on whether the property ultimately increases in value or it decreases in value. So what happens is if the at the date of the transfer from an, for a gifted asset, if the value or fair market value of the asset being given is lower than the donor's basis, then you have to keep track of, well, what was the donor's basis, the giver's basis, and what was, and also what was the fair market value on the date of the transfer. But that be, that's because when the ultimate sale happens, if it is a gain, the recipient's going to use the carryover basis from the donor. But if it were a loss at the time the, it was ultimately disposed of, then you would use the fair market value on the date of the gift. So um, the other thing that happens is um, the if there's if it's ever disposed of or sold for an amount between the two values, like bet it's lower than the uh, donor basis but it's higher than the fair market value at that date of transfer, then when you're using this dual basis, the, the last complication becomes if the asset is sold for an amount between basis, the donor's basis and the fair market value, you use the selling price as the basis to induce a no gain or loss circumstance. So it's a artificially substituted basis that is exactly the same as a sales price in order to affect no gain or loss. So this is the complication. All this, if the fair market value on the day of the gift is less than the donor's basis, that's when this dual basis happens that requires this three option scenario. If you're selling for a gain, you still can use the substitute carry and not substitute, I'm sorry, carry over basis of the donor. If you're selling for a loss, um, then the recipient um, you use, you use, can use the basis that is the fair market value of the data gift. If you sell from somewhere between those two values, you force it to say no gain or loss. And so the other thing I haven't mentioned yet was if back here, whenever you had a value that was higher than the donor's basis, you can also increase your basis by any gift tax that the donor had to pay on the transfer. And so that doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen sometimes. And when it happens, you can, you do increase the basis of the donors as the asset comes in their hand. So their, their value is the same as in the hands of the donor plus the gift tax that was attributable to it. So we'll see some of those at times. 
All right. So holding period for these kind of gifted assets, if you if you are allowed to use the carryover values. So in the scenario where um, the fair market value is higher than the donor's basis, then your held your uh, holding period would also be a carryover holding period. So whatever the donor was holding it as long term or short term, that would be the same thing you would take it as. And then um, if if you have a situation where there, the value is lower on the day that the transfer than the donor's basis, then the holding period would reset to be the day of the transfer or the date of the gift. So that's another downside to um, the value being lower is you, is you lose the long-term uh, treatment. All right, so that is gifting. We'll work some exercises about that later that kind of clear that up, that put some numbers to it. And uh, it's not rocket science. It's just complex because there's different scenarios. If it's this, it's this. And the exceptions can throw people at times. So you need to make sure that you understand these rules, but they are pretty much just what I've described. It's not more complex than that. It's just that when you start to look at a scenario, it's sometimes hard to identify which of them you're looking at unless you really have this down in your head. So you look first at the initial transaction to see if you have a firm ability to use the carryover basis. If you do, then just go with that. If you don't have that or carryover basis, like I mentioned in this first scenario, instead you have a dual basis, then you have to evaluate, well, what is the sales price in, in, uh, indicating? Is it showing a gain over the value at the date of the transfer? All right, so then the next one, inheritances. Totally different from gifting. So if someone leaves you something in their will, it's not the same as if they give it to you while they're alive. If someone leaves you something in their will, the value is the fair market value on the date of death. And so the alternative date, six months later, is also a possibility that could be your, your value. But that would be because the estate that was, pro they, they were processing the estate and they determined they wanted to use an alternative value as of six months later. So that's determined by the estate, not by the person who received the gift. So you don't really have an option on that, but most estates um, don't have to even go through um, the uh, filing of the seven, form 706 to file a, a estate tax return. So most times when you get an asset through death, it is the fair market value on the date of death. It's just that if they had to a taxable estate or had to file a tax return form 706, then they get to choose which valuation date they want to use. And if they choose that six months later date, then that also reflects the value that's going to come through for your carryover basis, which is a stepped up basis to either the date of death or the six month alternative date determined by the estate. And then the holding period for inherited assets is going to be long term. Um, OK, and then disallowed losses. Related party transactions is one of the big ones that disallows a loss. And in, in actuality, in a small practice, you see this all the time. And that's one of the ones that's most often disallowed, other than maybe the passive losses, which we've already covered in previous chapters. But for uh, property transactions, disallowed losses related to related parties are very prevalent. Okay, so um, if you have a gain on um, assets, depreciable assets that you that were transferred or sold to a related party, it's always ordinary income. No favorable treatment for capital gains rates, just ordinary income. And then, so that's one downside to transfer into a related party. And then the other one is on the losses. If you have a loss when you have a sale to a related party, it's not deductible, it's suspended until such time as that individual, the one who bought the property from the related party, ultimately sells it to an unrelated party. And so if you have um, these relationships that make you a related party, the relationship could be a family member, like a sibling, a, a spouse, um, an ancestor or a lineal descendant. So it can go up the line, down the line, and spouses, uh, um, and descendants of those uh, of those uh, relatives. So any of these people that are the family members or a corporation or a trust or a partnership, 
when there's a strong relationship between you, like uh, for a corporation, greater than 50% ownership in a corporation makes that corporation a related party. And so if those relationships are there that cause the related party rules to come in, it's under section 267, then that means you can't deduct a loss until you actually trans the part, until the ultimately one of the related parties transfers to an unrelated party. And then if you had a gain, you could use the loss to offset that gain. So those are better understood once you have some examples too. So that'll come later. Another uh, basis uh, difference is a wash sale sto uh, stock. Um, a loss is disallowed on a wash sale whenever you sell a stock and replace it within 30 days before or after the sale, then that's, they're trying to say, you're just playing the market, basically. They're limiting the amount of loss that can be taken when you replace that stock because you're just taking into account fluctuations in the market in order to try to get a loss. And so that's not real. And so, or it's not a long-term loss, I guess. Or, I mean, it's not a, I guess it's not a um, long-term impact. impact because of the repurchase. But in any case, the basis includes the cost of the replacement stock plus this deferred loss. So ultimately, when you wind up selling the stock, you're gonna get this loss that gets suspended, but uh, you just can't take it immediately. So it's gonna add to the basis in your stock that you replaced. So um, that's wash sale. Then uh, the next thing is personal property converted to business use. There's some limitations on this. The loss basis for personal property converted is lowest lower of either the adjusted basis on the day of the conversion over to a business asset or the fair market value on that date that it was placed in service. So whichever is lower. So you can't take more than your basis and you can't take more than the uh, fair market value. So for gain, gain basis is just adjusted basis of the asset. So when you're trying to decide what to put on your depreciation schedule, you use the loss basis. So when you're looking at a tax return, you would only see the loss basis, not the gain basis. It's because gain basis is adjusted basis regardless. But um, on a tax return, if the basis is, if the loss basis is different, in other words, it was based on the lower fair market value, then that'd be the only thing you would see. So you would have to keep track of this gain basis and loss basis separately for this personal property got transferred. Okay, so that's that's another one. Sticky, a little bit like the, the gifting, but not quite as complex. Um, Non-taxable exchanges. These are some of the things we need to make sure we understand. Like kind exchanges is another complex concept that they're bringing forth related to property in this chapter. And so it's really whenever um, the gain or loss is deferred or postponed to a future period. So you could trade properties and not pay tax on the gain, but it just has to be like kind property, meaning you, you can't just trade for some d totally separate kind of property. Um, it needs to be real estate and it has to be uh, business or investment use. So if it's business or investment use, it's it's considered like kind. And so it also must be traded for business and or investment use property. So the property you're giving up and the property you're obtaining have to all be business or investment property. And there can't be a crossover between U.S. Rent realty and foreign realty. So if you're giving up U.S. realty, you can't invest in foreign realty and eliminate the taxability of the gain in, or not eliminate, postpone the taxability of the gain. Um, and if you have foreign realty that you're trying to transfer or uh, trade, it can't be traded for U.S. property. So if it's foreign, you've traded for foreign. If it's U.S., you've traded for U.S. And it's always got to be realty, not other property, not personality. The timing is it, it usually is simultaneously, ideally from the CPA's perspective, much easier if it's simultaneously, but it could be a deferred like kind when lots of times that involves a third party where it's a three-way um, trade, and which of course makes it much more complex. But if I, my suggestion would be if you're ever involved in a three-way like kind exchange, just go ahead and hire a tax attorney and have them deal with that rather than you as a just individual CPA um, trying to 
chase down all the nuances that have that come into play on a on a multiple property deferred like kind of exchange. So on a straight up trade, then it is not complex. It is something certainly within that realm of what an individual CPA should be able to do. And so those things we already talked about, about the requirements of what kind of property will trade as like kind. You have to know that. Then you have to know this timing. And um, if you're using the deferred, the timing has to also include the replacement property has to be identified within 45 days of giving up the property and the actual exchange where you receive the new property has to happen within 180 days, which is about six months of disposing of the original one. And so again, that's that deferred like kind that often includes a multiple person like kind of exchange, multiple property, sorry, uh, like kind of exchange, uh, not multiple person necessarily. Well, every time it's multiple person, I guess if you're exchanging, but I'm just saying it's multiple properties that might be more than two. Um, and it's a deferred like kind. But if it's not deferred, you still have um, the timing has to still be right in that you have a two year period that you have to. Um, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong thing. No, that's involuntary conversions, which I kind of get tangled up. I'm sorry to say uh, the two year periods in the involuntary conversions. I'll come back to that. So this one, the timing is if it's not immediate, the trade, then it's got to be identified within 45 days and it's got to be actually transpire that the titles change within 180 days. All right. So now the exchange types, it could be like kind for like kind, total no cash involved, no other asset involved, just like kind property traded. So I wanted to operate in one city. This other person I know wants to operate in my city. So I go and I trade a property in city A for a property in city B. The other party trades. It's an equal exchange, no issue, no taxability. So any gain I had would just get rolled into the basis of the new asset. Um, it's, so in other words, it wouldn't get rolled. It just would never be recognized until I sold the new asset. So it, it's rolled in, in other words, because the basis rolls over to the new assets. So I'll get that right. All right. So now, but that's not very, that's not very normal for them to be 100% equal transfer. Usually there's boot. So let's talk about boot for a second. The boot is talking about anything that's not a like kind property. Most often the boot is cash, but sometimes the boot could be another asset that was traded, like maybe a personality asset, not a personal asset, a personality, non-realty asset. So if it's not a like kind property, it doesn't qualify as a like kind property, then it's automatically consumed and it's in the transaction, it's automatically boot. Okay, so if it's boot, then gain will be recognized up to the value of the boot. It's the taxable amount is, in, because of that, the taxable amount is the lower of either the gain or the amount of the boot. So uh, like kind part is still tax free. If it exceeds the amount of the boot, then the gain exceeds the amount of the boot, then the rest of it can be considered the like kind exchange, which means not taxable now, just adjusted the basis. The basis in the new asset is the fair market value reduced by any gain deferred. Um, so basically that, that, that's the way that we calculate it. We look at the fair market value and we reduce it by a deferred gain so that it's going to make it taxable at the point when the, when the sale um, comes. The other way of looking at would be, it would be the, um, the amount exchanged plus the original basis but not counting the taxable parts. So I think the straight that they do this because it's a little more straightforward. It comes to the same result when you just use the fair market value and minus the gain that never got, um, that gain that was realized, but not recognized. Okay. Now that's like kind of exchanges. Definitely can cause you some headaches for our purposes, pretty straightforward, but in reality, not as much so. All right, involuntary conversions. This is similar in that it's um, a deferred gain on a sale. You have a, you have um, 
you have a gain, but you're not going to show it as taxable yet because you have a, a way to postpone it. So this would be dispositions related to natural disasters, accidents, thefts, condemnations, eminent domain, things where it's beyond your control, but you lost your property. And so rather than having to pay tax on it, you can defer the gain by reinvesting the, the uh, proceeds, usually proceeds of insurance proceeds or like government payment for eminent domain. If someone wants to make, if the government wants to make a highway through your property and they take half of your front yard or half of the, uh, your parking lot for your business, then they would pay you for that, for that eminent domain. Even if you might not have a choice, they would pay you. And so that would be like you sold the property for that amount. And if you, your property was destroyed by a hurricane, then the insurance company would pay you for the damage. So it's like you sold it for that piece of property that was damaged for the insurance proceeds. So rather than having to pay tax on those, in those cases, you can reinvest those proceeds instead of saying you sold the property, you can reinvest them. And, and so um, if you do that, then your gain would be deferred. And so a direct conversion, on the other hand, is not where they pay you for an asset, but where someone makes you good for the deal by giving you another property to replace your property. And so if you have a property for property exchange related to involuntaries, then there's no gain. It's just a carryover basis. So if you, for instance, if you had an um, automobile that was destroyed and that, and the, um, another automobile was provided instead of payment, then that would just be a carryover basis for that. And then for, most often that's not the way it's done. A direct conversion is not that common. Mostly it's indirect conversion where you're insured. So your company gives you cash to replace or the um, government seizes your property and they pay you for that piece of land in cash. So indirect conversion is when property is is a property for cash exchange, followed by reinvestment of the proceeds. A taxable part is the part that wasn't reinvested, basically. Um, so the taxable, to calculate the taxable amount, you would calculate the gain realized, and then also the amount that's not reinvested, and the gain is the lesser of either the gain on the transaction, like whatever the proceeds are, minus the adjusted basis, that's the gain. Either, so the taxable gain is either that realized gain we just talked about, or it is the amount that was not reinvested. So you can eliminate all the taxability by reinvesting as much as the gain. And so replacement property um, must be similar or related to the original property. And then replacement property the must be the replacement must be done. This is the two years I mentioned earlier within two years of the cash um, exchange. So whenever you get paid from your insurance, you have two years to find another property and invest back into it. If it's a condemnation, they extend that to three years time. They'll let you have to replace before you have to pay tax. Okay, now that's a, that's another one. Now here's uh, the last one the textbook talks about is a sale from the principal residence. So this is a, not a, a deferral or a postponement. It is actually tax free. A sale of a personal residence, if there's a gain there, up to $500,000 can be excluded and never shown as taxable on a married and joint couple or $250,000 on any other taxpayer individual. So um, if it's... Um, there's no need to reinvest the proceeds because it's just not tax. It's deferred. Uh, it's not deferred. It's it's just uh, excluded from tax. So you the property that you're selling has to be a principal residence. It has to be sold as a principal residence as well, and you have to have lived in the property as a residence in two out of the preceding five years at least. Uh, the house the pres residence could be a house, a motor home, a co-op apartment, a condo, even a houseboat. Uh, so it just has to be what's considered a residence. And you can only do this exclusion once every two years. So that's why you see some people that live in a house, fix it up, make it better. They have a built-in gain there and then they sell it. They exclude the gain. 
Then they start over with another property. And a few years later, they sell that one because this one is able to be repeated, this principal residence gain. And it's not a taxable event. So you can make some equity without having to pay tax on it. All right, so here's the land yet. I don't believe they mentioned that in this, in this chapter, but most textbooks that talk about these types of things also mention installment sales. So I thought I should mention it. In real life, you see this a lot where uh, individuals self-finance sales transactions. So this would be like you own a rental property and you offer them a chance to, to buy the property. And so they, instead of paying rent to you, they're paying a payment toward the purchase. And a lot of times in it, where we are here in Louisiana, they do this thing where it's not the title doesn't transfer until the payments are all made, bond for deed. And so that it depends on where you live as to whether that's an option. But selling a property, self-financing it, it opens the door to be able to do this gross profit percentage as the method installment sale. Um method of, of reporting the income, meaning you don't pay tax on the transaction when you make the sale, you pay a portion of the tax, you pay a, um, you assess a portion of the tax each time that the payments are collected. So what you would do is show the sales. If you sell something for $100,000 that cost you $60,000, your basis is $60,000, then you have a $40,000 gross profit on the sale. And that means you have a 40% gross profit percentage. So then as you go along, every thousand dollars you collect on the thing, on this uh, asset that you sold is taxable at that 40% rate, the gross profit percentage. So a thousand dollars, every dollar that you collect is taxed at the 40%. So for a thousand dollars, you would be taxed. You would show as taxable income, a, a uh, capital gain of 400. Uh, if it's a capital gain property that you sold. So that is just saying that instead of recognizing the income all at one time, if you're selling it over time, you can use the installment method, which means take a percentage of it as taxable each time. Now, there's some assets that don't qualify, like business assets that are in your ongoing uh, transactions of the business, like your inventory. You cannot use the installment method on that taxability you just would show it as income and then marketable securities like stocks and bonds you cannot show the gains over a period of time because collectability is stretched over a period of time that's not permissible for those assets either and the other one that's not able to be done as installment method is the re recaptured portion of depreciation on the gains so if you had a long-term asset that you had to recapture some depreciation on which is a topic we'll talk about in another chapter as well um that that recaptured part does not qualify for installment sales. So you would just reduce the whole gain by that when you get to the point that you're calculating how much is um, to be used for installment method and just only take the part that's eligible for installment sales as the tracking the amount that you're going to tax uh, at the gross profit percentage. So that one, again, is the lanyard that's not going to be tested because it's not in this textbook, but it is something you need to know. Okay, so that's what I've got. Thanks so much.